Welcome uh, everybody to this uh, installment of the, our series of colloquia uh, organized jointly organized by ICTP and IIT Mumbai. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have you here today for a uh, uh, talk by Richard Ricky, uh, who will be introduced uh, soon by my colleagues. Uh, I will just say a couple of words about this uh, series. Uh, and it is now it's uh, it's the seventh uh, uh, installment, and uh, we really hope that this will be uh, conducive to a longer term collaboration between ICTP and uh, IA. We on subjects like biophysics and uh, uh, matters. Uh, with this, I leave the floor to Mitun for the introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, so it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Richa Ricci. Uh, Richa is uh, a prof associate professor at ICER Pune. Uh, she did her PhD uh, from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bombay. Uh, she was then a postdoc at the National Institutes of Health uh, with uh, Jennifer Lippincourt Schwartz. So Richa has been working on um, development uh, and the principles of development, uh, in particular in Drosophila. Uh, she was recently awarded uh, the Senior Fellowship uh, by the Wellcome Trust uh, India Alliance in 2022. Uh, so today she's going to talk to us about uh, form and function in embryogenesis. Uh, so just before I hand it over to Richard, uh, so if you, the way we'll address questions is that if you have like, uh, so Richard will stop at like, where one section of our talk sort of ends in order to take questions. In between, if there are like minor clarifications, please raise your hand and then unmute yourself and ask. Uh, but like, if there are major questions, please wait for Richard to like reach the end of a section and then we can discuss. Uh, with that, Richard, I hand it over to you. Um, uh, thank you, thank you, Mithun. Thank you, Antonio and the organizers for inviting me uh, to give this talk. Um, so just at the start, I'd like to mention that, of course, I'm a cell biologist by heart and training. And uh, a lot of the tools that I use are that of genetics to alter uh, gene function and to look at really the molecular architecture that is involved in a certain uh, function of uh, cell shape remodeling in embryogenesis. Um, in general, we look at uh, either the complete uh, cell shape remodeling, or we also actually look at organelles and how they're distributed and what could their function be uh, to regulate the cell shape remodeling in embryogenesis and in stem cell differentiation. So today I thought uh, that I could share a couple of stories which uh, made us learn about how uh, early embryo uh, formation of epithelial-like polygonal cells occurs in Drosophila embryos. And uh, what is the meaning of this or what is the interaction of this kind of architecture on uh, exchange of molecules? And uh, what we find is that it may have uh, some implications on how gradients are exchanged. And hopefully, you know, I can give you some appreciation of that. So um, just, just one second. Um, just at the start, I think, you know, when I was going through uh, some writings by biologists and physicists about, about what uh, are interesting phenomena in embryology, I found these two quotes, which really were, I was taken by, and I'll just read them to give a start to my talk, which is that embryology and morphology cannot proceed independently of all reference to the general laws of matter, to the laws of physics, and of mechanics, a very old, uh, uh, you know, deduction. And then a second one by uh, Morgan, who also is the initiator of the use of flies uh, in uh, developmental biology in genetics. And uh, where he says that there is, I think, but one way in which we may hope to find out what forces or energies are at work during development and whether these forces are the same forces known to the chemist and the physicist. Only by means of well-planned experiments can we expect by isolation and recombination to discover the forces at work. So motivated by uh, you know, some of these uh, occurrences, I think it's interesting to try and look at uh, how, for example, cells form and how uh, gradients 
uh, form across these cells uh, using genetics and cell biology, but at the same time, think of uh, how um, physical principles may govern their uh, spread uh, across uh, different tissue types. So, um, so taking by that, uh, just one second, my computer is giving a little bit of trouble. Yeah. So motivated by basically the fact that uh, metazoan embryos, basically embryos which are of multicellular organisms, uh, they typically start their development with either a spherical or an elliptical cell. And, uh, and then uh, as division proceeds, it uh, sort of gives rise to very morphologically distinct cell types. These uh, cell types have a cross section of a polygon. They are, uh, they are attached to each other uh, with strong forces and uh, so that they can interact with the environment but also sort of protect the embryo from inside. Now, uh, these are embryos of various different organisms and we are actually interested in, uh, we study the Drosophila embryo. And if we look at, for example, the Drosophila embryo, again, it starts it, uh, its development with uh, one nucleus, which then divides to give many. There is an organization of the nucleus and the plasma membrane at the periphery of the embryo. And uh, when we look at this organization in the cross section, it looks very much like an epithelial cell type with a polygonal membrane array. And this is something which I will show you. And uh, it is only until later division cycles where there's an extension of this plasma membrane, which drops down and actually gives rise to complete cells. So even though this is a very, very organized structure, this is an open structure. And one of the interests in this particular stage of embryogenesis has been that uh, there are various gradient molecules which are produced in distinct regions of, for example, the anterior or the posterior, the dorsal and the ventral. And uh, they are uh, exchanging in between cells. There could be limited exchange in between these particular uh, nuclei. And it's of interest to understand, uh, you know, what are the mechanisms by which this exchange uh, happens. Now, uh, just to give you a perspective of the size, uh, so this is really an ellipsoid and uh, it is around 500 microns in length and around 200 microns in the, in the uh, short axis of the ellipse. And um, these are uh, sort of semi-transparent, so they are beautiful embryos to image the various different cell shape changes that occur uh, in development. So here is an example of, you know, what kind of imaging one can do. One can place these embryos on a cover slip of a confocal microscope and image the various events which are taking place. So for example, what you see here on the top left is uh, essentially the synchronous division cycles in the early embryo where the nuclei are dividing and uh, they are multiplying. And if you, for example, think of the changes, the cells are essentially are becoming smaller and smaller as these divisions proceed. Now, uh, this is a time point at which the plasma membrane extends downwards and it gives rise to these individual cell types, uh, which are epithelial in nature. And after complete cells are formed, there is a process of castrulation which takes place where for example, um, there is a change in shape which is occurring in a certain region of each of these cells which formed and the cells are now incorporated into the embryo, right? So, uh, so hopefully one can appreciate that there is a whole host of changes which take place to form these cells. And then uh, once these cells are formed, they are also have to be plastic enough to cause changes so that uh, they can be invaginated into the embryo, especially in the first uh, process of germ layer formation in uh, gastrulation. Now, while all of these uh, changes are occurring to give rise to formation of epithelial cell types, one of the hallmark features of all of these embryos is that there is the presence of gradients uh, of protein molecules, for example, across the embryo in various different uh, directions. This is an example of the chick embryo. And uh, these gradients 
uh, help in patterning different regions of the embryo such that different regions then will assume different fates of the head or the tail or the torso of uh, the animal. So uh, these gradients are essentially, uh, you know, there's a source for the gradient where the molecule concentration is the highest. And then there is a sink part of it where essentially the molecule concentration drops. And depending upon the concentration of the gradient, there are different outcomes of these tissues which are actually present in this. And uh, so coming back to sort of the first part of what we've been interested in is the formation of these uh, polygonal cell types, right? So imagine a spherical or an elliptical cell and uh, it is undergoing division. So the first division itself uh, is quite uh, deterministic in the sense that it gives rise to two cells where uh, the cells are actually facing each other and uh, this particular membrane, plasma membrane of the cell is contacting with the neighboring cell. Whereas if one imagines this plasma membrane it is actually contacting with the environment. And uh, so obviously facing these two different environments, the functions of these membranes become quite different. And as it continues to divide, there is the formation of these tall cells. And uh, these cells are organized such that uh, there are uh, protein complexes which adhere or you know bind these adjacent membranes and typically they organize uh, such that if we look at the distribution of the polygonal architecture then it is uh, very often hexagon dominant right just similar like to like a bee beehive and uh, these are examples of uh, different sorts of embryos and if you see you know they might have a different shape from which they begin with but uh, typically the division gives rise to this formation of hexagon dominant uh, cell types and uh, different sorts of embryos, whereas whether it's the mouse or the sea urchin or Drosophila. So, um, so we've been interested in understanding what is the first uh, set of events that take place when epithelial-like polygonal cells form in Drosophila embryogenesis, and what is the molecular nature of transitions which occurs in this. So I just show you some analysis which sort of uh, gave rise to this. And even before I go into this, I'll, I'd like to you know, talk about uh, the people who did this work. So Bipasha and Samir along with a lot of students actually did uh, some of this uh, work. And Samir uh, also, Samir along with Amitabh Mithun, Bipasha and Pampa um, helped us in understanding the relevance of exchange of molecules in this architecture which comes up, right? So what is this architecture that we are talking about? So typically when the nuclei go to the periphery, now the plasma membrane sort of incompletely encircles each nucleus. And if we look at the cross section of this particular stage, what one sees is that it transitions from a typical circular organization to a polygonal organization, right? So how do we know this? if we, we can image these embryos while they are dividing. And uh, in each of these division cycles, there is a cell shape transition which is taking place. So if you look at the start of this movie, which is here, you see that it's roughly circular. And then uh, these yellow, uh, you know, uh, region of interests which are drawn are on the periphery of the membrane. And then the membrane becomes taut and it is more polygonal in nature. So, so with each division cycle in these early division cycles, which are uh, syncytial in nature, where the plasma membrane is not completely encircled each of the uh, nuclei, uh, there is a pattern, a geometry of organization of the plasma membrane, which is emerging, which is of interest to understand. Um, and uh, interest to understand, uh, for example, what does it depend upon? You know, what does the geometry depend upon? Now, while these shape changes are taking place, uh, so I'm showing you these shape, shape changes really in the two-dimensional uh, arena. The embryo is a three-dimensional structure. The plasma membrane, which is on the side, is also invaginating inwards, okay? So if you look at this movie, this is actually the true movie. So as the cells keep dividing, they're not complete cells, but for just simplicity, I'll call them cells or pseudo cells. What one sees is that the plasma membrane invaginates inward and it retracts, all right? And it turns out that the cell shape change which is occurring actually depends upon 
the rate at which the plasma membrane enters inside and comes out. So just to you know think about how we want to look at cell shape change, it's a very simple uh, parameter, which is called a circularity, which is four pi area over perimeter square. Where if, for example, uh, the cross section was a perfect circle, then the circularity would come as one. Now we're asking as the plasma membrane extends inwards, is there a change in circularity? as the furrow membrane, which is the membrane which is furrowing inwards, it's as its length changes, right? So, and what do we find? So this is the same movie, but I'm also showing it to you with snapshots of the, uh, of the lateral membrane going inwards. And what you can notice is that from this point when the organization is roughly circular, to this point when the organization is, uh, is polygonal, there is an increase in lateral length which occurs. And what we see is that, uh, you know, cell division after cell division after cell division, there is a repetition in the way uh, there is a drop in circularity for the formation of this polygonal architecture. So there seems to be a point at which uh, there is a change in circularity, uh, which then gives rise to the polygon architecture. Uh, and it occurs at a time point at which there is enough lateral membrane which is available, right? So, uh, so what is this lateral membrane? This lateral membrane is, of course, this membrane. We are talking about this membrane. And uh, the membrane obviously has a host of, uh, of uh, protein complexes, which is stabilizing adhesion between these adjacent membranes to give rise to this particular polygon architecture. Now, uh, when we look at the organization of this polygon, what we see is that, uh, for example, when the nuclei have divide, uh, divided nine times and they're entering the 10th cycle, the plasma membrane is roughly sort of circular organized. It's only 11 onwards, one starts seeing this sort of polygon architecture come about. And when we look at the uh, presence of this, uh, the kinds of polygons, then they are uh, equivalent between pentagons and hexagons in the nuclear cycle 11. And then after that, they become hexagon dominated. All right. So these gray ones are essentially showing you that uh, they are hexagon dominated. Now, Lisa, I want uh, to stop you a bit. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Sure. Sorry. sorry. I'm extremely sorry. So I'm a bit confused. I understand this circle is going uh, to uh, pointed uh, angular polygons, but, uh, and I understand you call them cellular structures, but something from somewhere is going in that uh, connection I have lost actually. So as something goes in, some plasma membrane goes in, uh, so, but I can't understand, uh, assuming plasma, some, something is missing, I can't understand whether plasma membrane is going in and, and how is that related to something. So I just want to maybe to one of the up. ways, yeah, so I'll just, I'll just clarify that. Yeah, sorry. Um, what we, so what's happening is that there is a change in shape which is occurring in this two dimension, right? But this change in shape is occurring coincident with the plasma membrane becoming longer in the Z direction into the embryo. Okay. And, okay. Uh, and so now imagine a three dimensional, uh, you know, rectangular uh, cell. And, uh, and what you see is that as the cell becomes taller and taller, that is when you have a more oh, stable oh. polygon architecture, which is coming about. All right. So, uh, so uh, again, going back. Excuse me, sorry. Uh, so, uh, just following up with what you said. Yeah, so, sorry. during this, uh, like you know, uh, growth of plasma membrane uh, vertically in. So, there is a multiplication of uh, the cells as well, right? So, the multiplication of cells occurs uh, from one cycle to the next cycle, right? So, when the plasma membrane is invaginating inside, that time the cells are not multiplying. They are going through a cell cycle, but they are not multiplying. So, this kind of shows you what's happening. Like, for example, uh, the different phases of the cell cycle, we have interphase, uh, prophase, metaphase. So within one cell cycle, there is a change in organization from circular organization with a short lateral membrane into the embryo uh, to a polygonal organization with a long lateral membrane into the embryo. Okay, so there is this change in shape which is occurring in each cell cycle as it is dividing. All right. Okay. And what we notice is that within each cell cycle, there is a change in shape, which is signified by the drop in circularity. And it occurs 
at a particular point in time which correlates with a certain length regime of the lateral membrane all right so only when the lateral membrane dips into the cell at a certain length which is about you know five and a half microns that is when this specific change in shape from circular to polygon occurs right so this is uh, what i was trying to show and when we look at the organization of the polygons themselves then what we see is that there is a particular time at which so even though you know polygon architecture begins in uh, nuclear cycle 11 which is essentially after 10 division cycles um there is uh, there is an organization of hexagon dominant polygon architecture only from nuclear cycle 12 onwards all right so uh, so there's some change which is occurring from 11 to 12 to actually give rise to this hexagon dominance and i think uh, one of the reasons why hexagon dominance is uh, you know emphasized so much is because it is an energy effective organization for uh, the plasma membrane so it comes up at this particular time and obviously it is coming up at this particular time you know as a biologist it's interesting to me to try and understand what kind of molecules, for example, get enriched at this particular time point to give rise to this stable structure. So if I knock these molecules out, will now I delay the formation of hexagon dominance, right? So, uh, so that's how uh, one would look at this as a biologist. So yes, hexagon dominance basically comes up at this particular uh, time point. Nisha, I had one question. Yes. Yeah, about the geometry. So initially, when the cells are more or less spherical, so their yeah. partitions are not uh, barely touching with each other, right? Absolutely. Whereas when they are between hexagon, yeah. it's a common partition to between two cells. Is that right? Yes, so, absolutely. So when the when the organization of the plasma membrane is uh, is circular, the um, the dip of the lateral membrane is very small. And only when it is in the polygonal form is the dip of the lateral membrane even longer. All right. And um, uh, so, yes, the partition, if we call the plasma membrane as a partition at this stage, is very short in interface when the cells are circular. And it is longer in metaphase when the cells are present in a polygonal organization. All right. And uh, what is also true is that when we start looking at these cell shape change with respect to the length, not only is the length correlated with the organization in a somewhat polygonal architecture, but also the length is correlated with the hexagon dominance feature as well. Right. So, 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 you know, what does this length mean, right? To a biologist, to me, for example, what it means is that there has to be stabilization of enough number of protein complexes on these uh, lateral membranes to uh, basically uh, give rise to this change of cell shape which takes place uh, in uh, you know, an energy minimized uh, condition and so on. So it's of interest to try and find out what kind of molecules actually give rise to this cell shape change. Um, and, uh, and, you know, going ahead, I mean, there are, we've looked at several different molecules in this particular context, but I'll just show you two uh, cells. Yeah, sorry, yeah, please. So, yeah, yeah, uh, please. So in a previous slide, uh, you showed two figures and it seemed like in one of the image sequence, the density of the cells was going up. Yes, in so other, from nuclear cycle 11 going... to nuclear cycle 12, there is an increase in the density of cells. And uh, because uh, the embryo is sort of a closed structure, it's not growing actually at this time. Uh, so it's also true that the uh, number of uh, cells or pseudo cells increase, but they are becoming smaller and they are also becoming taller in a sense. Okay, so uh, they are actually uh, having longer and longer lateral membranes as these uh, division cycles proceed from one uh, stage to another stage. So, so is it a combination of the cell density as well as the like elongation of the cell or I mean, how do you, uh, how do you differentiate between these two? It seems like if you keep on stuffing more and more cells into the same area, the only uh, perfect, like the most efficient packing has to be hexagonal. Yes, absolutely. 
so if you keep uh, so so what is what we what we can note is that when the cell density is smaller uh, then the organization is a sort of equivalent between pentagon and hexagons and when the cell density becomes uh, more and more and you rightly said that it becomes hexagon dominated and it can stabilize into a uh, you know organization which is a uh, hexagon dominated architecture yes absolutely so 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 you're, so you're saying like although you are giving more emphasis on the length of the cell or whatever you call so it the right the length also is... changes during this time so this particular so, change from or uh, in shape all right occurs so because it, of an increase in length so it's conjunction of the cell density as well as the elongation yes. of cell yes 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 i mean so there is also a particular, particular yes absolutely so there is also a particular length which is present for example in nucleus cycle 11 the length which is present in nucleus cycle 11 is shorter than the length which is present in nucleus cycle 12 all right and uh, okay. so it seems like how much uh, it invaginates inwards is uh, sort of related to the occurrence of the hexagon dominance okay okay yeah Chaha, this is rope here just a quick question okay, yeah that uh, you know is there any biological importance to this close packing um, you need something to stitch the plasma membranes together one cell yeah. to the next but the gaps in the circular case versus in the no gaps in the polygonal case is that important biology yes. it's yeah it's definitely important it allows for uh, divisions to proceed normally so if for example you know this is also occurring at a certain stage of the cell cycle which is the metaphase stage of the cell cycle at this particular stage the nuclei are not there and uh, the uh, nuclear material now is in the cytoplasm uh so there could be two importance one importance has been actually uh, shown again and again which is that for example when these lateral membranes do not extend then adjacent spindles will end up mixing and actually forming a tripolar spindle organization and okay. this is sort of devastating to certain regions of the embryo so what happens is then you know the nuclei which form in the next cycle become really large and often they are not able to support the cytoskeletal architecture around them and the nuclei will just fall inside so okay. that is one use of it the other use which is emerging is that this extension of the lateral membrane also to some extent inhibits the flow of cytoplasmic molecules in between these adjacent cells and uh, this inhibition of flow is most likely very important for fine tuning uh, response to gradient molecules right so this is still something which is worth testing Okay. but um, i mean there isn't a test which is available but these two are the consequences of this and also a rigid uh, membrane of a certain type gives a certain uh, strength to the plasma membrane in in this organization and then that is uh, responsible for uh, a lot of the cell shape changes which need to occur at later time points uh, during gastrulation for example thanks thanks yeah <clears throat> okay so so in delving into molecules which might be important for this kind of transition that takes place there are two sets of molecules which uh, generally typically the whole of the developmental biology field will look at one set of molecules are uh, you know part of an adherence junction complex which is essentially a, an adherent complex which brings together the lateral membranes uh, some of the key molecules there are cadherin and cadherin is uh, a transmembrane protein which uh, then links these uh, adjacent plasma membranes together and also organizes the cytoskeleton inside which is the actin cytoskeleton another uh, set of uh, molecules is essentially the actomyosin uh, complex so the actomyosin complex uh, by the amount of contractility the complex has gives rise to constriction ability inside the plasma membrane and uh, for example if it has a lot of tension there is a lot of uh, constriction which takes place inside the cell then the cell is likely to be round right so if the constriction is is relaxed a little bit so that adhesion can take place uh, at the expected normal level then uh, then basically one could think of a polygon architecture arising so what i'm trying to say is that a balance between adhesion 
and contractile forces inside the cell is likely to regulate the cell shape change which occurs in this context right so what we did was within the same regime where this cell shape change is taking place we just looked at the concentration of cadherin versus the concentration of myosin with a readout of myosin all right so these are uh, essentially fluorescently tagged proteins and all we are doing is looking at its organization so now this is a time point at which the lateral membrane is below that threshold uh, regime and what you see is that there is uh, some presence of cadherin but this much less as compared to when the polygon is stabilized whereas if i look at the uh, the molecules which lend contractility to the system which is the myosin molecules what we see is that there is a uh, increased distribution at exactly this time where the organization is circular and then it becomes much less as the polygon forms right so so what this uh, implies is that there is an increase in adhesion and a decrease in contractility which is allowing for this particular cell shape change to take place right so it's also of interest to try and understand what are the uh, forces which are actually changing when this uh, change in organization takes place right so there were two ways in which we try to uh, look at the forces one is to essentially just to see how the molecules are being exchanged in this particular paradigm and uh, this is looking at an exchange of molecules uh, for the myosin tag which is squash uh, so we are photo bleaching a particular region as the cell shape change takes place either below threshold or above threshold and what we see is that if we look at the rate of exchange of uh, these molecules we find that when the when the membrane is above the threshold when this particular cell shape change has taken place the amount of myosin which is exchanging in this region which is bleached is less as compared to earlier when the uh, when the cells are organized as circles so which then also says that there is uh, some change in the way the contractile machinery is getting engaged with each other where uh, for example the mobile fraction of uh, this these particular myosin molecules is decreasing above threshold along with an increase in the uh, the adhesion molecules which takes place and uh, in order to look at what's happening with respect to the tension in this membrane system one can do for example laser ablations uh, which i'll show you in the next slide but before going there this particular change in mobility of the myosin uh, which is not reflected in the change in mobility for the adhesion molecules all right so there is change in mobility and change in maybe engagement in the way the myosin is distributed in the membrane but for example the adhesion molecules don't show any such uh, particular change now what is the tension in this particular system so again we can look at the tension in the system uh in the membrane when it is below the threshold or above the threshold and what we see so that is essentially done by doing a laser ablation and uh, asking about uh, how much uh, recoil takes place away from the uh, away basically uh, of the membranes away from this point in which the membrane is cut and uh, what we find is that the recoil is much higher at a point in which there is the formation of this polygon structure so this polygon structure has a little more tension as compared to when it is in the circular form all right so this basically tells us about the membrane properties and also the organization of the cytoskeleton the properties of the cytoskeleton when these uh, shape change actually takes place right so just to summarize what i've shown you so far um below threshold where the lateral membranes are really short there is an increased uh, contractility there's not so much adhesion and above the threshold where the lateral membranes are long there is a uh, more adhesive forces and less contractility but the contractility is adjusted such that it stabilizes uh, this particular structure all right so in terms of one looking at the tension in the system it seems like the membrane is in a higher tension at this point as compared to 
at this point. And, uh, you know, I will not take you through the genetics, which we try to establish to see uh, whether it moves this way or this way. But just to summarize that the cardiac mobility remained unchanged, whereas myosin was stabilized a little more and the junctional tension basically increases in this particular structure. And to test this, what one can do, so it's just a summary of a whole lot of genetic and cell biological analysis that we did. Uh, what we did was we either increased myosin activity, which is increased contractility in the system, similar to what we found here, or we decreased myosin activity, our decreased contractility in the system, uh, similar to what is you know somewhat found here and asked about what is the dynamics of cell shape change which takes place and uh, what we found was that when we decrease myosin activity there is uh, the presence of adhesion in these lateral membranes uh, even at stages where we originally do not find it right so uh, where for example the organization of the plasma membrane is circular when we decrease myosin we start seeing that the polygon architecture is already stabilized. It's beginning to get stabilized at this stage. Whereas when we increase contractility, we are increasing uh, you know, the, uh, the contraction of the myosin network inside. We find that the polygon architecture just doesn't form at all, all right? So these membranes are really short and the polygon architecture does not form. So, so basically the conclusion of uh, this exercise was that it allowed us to learn that a certain balance of adhesion and contractility in this particular system, which is at least regulated by the uh, by cadherin as well as by the actomyosin contractile network, is responsible for this natural change in membrane shape or membrane organization into polygon architecture, which takes place from interface to metaphase stage. All right, so this is uh, one part of my story. And if there are any more questions on this part, I can take them now. <laughs> so Richard, oh, does, no. uh, just a quick, does this has some similarities to the different kind of structures in the endoplasmic reticulum from reticular to, uh, you know, I, I forget the terminology. Yeah. Uh, are you aware of the, what happens in that case? Like they so, say, reticular structure, they, you see these kind of polygonal things uh, in that situation also. So I think a lot of different, uh, you know, organelles will shape themselves, organelles, as well as a lot of different, uh, you know, sub uh, uh, organelle structures or membrane structures will essentially organize themselves into polygon architecture, right? So right, even right. Uh, endoplasmic uh, reticulum tubes, they organize uh, themselves like that. And uh, I mean, there, this is uh, this is something which is seen with a lot of different uh, cell cell but, but, organization. Yes. Right. But this balance of adhesive versus contractile forces has that been realized earlier in other context so you know from what i can understand so this adhesive and contractile is not new okay mm -hmm. what is new here is that uh, we can find this in a very uh, nascent epithelial like structure which is forming in the drosophila embryo right this uh, particular structure does not have basal membranes right so all of this cell shape transition which is uh, present here just depends upon the apical and the lateral membrane. So this is what is new in this particular study. Okay, okay, okay. The fact that there's a balance between adhesion and contractility is certainly not new. It's, sure, sure. It is there in a lot of cell types. In the case of organelles, there isn't, uh, you know, adjacent membranes don't really um, contact with each other to give rise to this organization. It is that uh, there are gaps and those give rise to uh, polygons, but we can uh, talk about that separately. Okay, okay sure. Um, hi, Richard. Uh, this yeah. is uh, so, uh, extremely intriguing uh, what we uh, talked about. So, you know, we've been working on epithelial uh, cell geometries, in particular, how that affects the intercellular communication, for example, by receptor ligand interaction, essentially, yeah. that's the principle. 
So I was just wondering, uh, in Drosophila, is there an analog of that? Are there? Th yeah, no, such there a th nice question. Um, can I interrupt you and first address some part of your question and then maybe you can continue. So, you know, one of the things with uh, Drosophila embryos, and this is not solved yet, is, uh, for example, the famous uh, toll dorsal signaling pathway, right? So toll is a receptor, which is very much like cadherin, actually. It has uh, these transmembrane domains where, uh, you know, molecules can interact. And uh, the toll dorsal signaling pathway is essentially responsible for formation of the ventral part of the embryo. Now, uh, toll, it turns out, actually is present only in the lateral domain. Okay, and this is something which we worked on during my postdoc. And it is not present in the apical domain. Now, toll is the one which is getting activated by the ligand uh, spatulae, which is actually present in the perivitellin space outside. So somehow, toll has to access the receptor in this lateral membrane, this very closed membrane, to activate it just on the ventral side, right? So though, for example, there is some very interesting cell biology questions out there which are not addressed. And uh, this, the organization of receptors in this particular uh, membrane is very, very uh, interesting. And it allows us to then ask about how this activation could take place. For sure, this is not something which has been studied systematically at all. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. So uh, this actually <laughs> makes my question even more, uh, you know, like intriguing for me. Uh, because, you know, we found that the shape change actually affects the cell cycle oscillator. So, you know, like, for example, depending on parameters, as it becomes more ordered, it can actually arrest the cell cycle, thereby, you know, stopping further growth of the, you know, uh, simulated epithelial tissue. So I was just wondering, do you see, uh, is there any phenomena in Drosophila which is going to be like icky? No, so, so again, a very, very nice question. You know, we've, uh, so we've been looking at architecture, right? And we've been looking at how molecules change this. And very often when we have a change in architecture, what we see is that the length of the cell cycle itself also changes. Okay. So if, for example, we have a certain set of actin regulatory molecule mutants, we find that the length of the cell cycle becomes really long. And uh, it's not surprising because... Uh, for example, some of these actin regulatory proteins, they bind to, uh, you know, the cortical region of the plasma membrane through regulatory molecules. And this is also a place at which the centrosomes are present. So, uh, so the rate at which the centrosome reorganization takes place in this system, which is going to directly regulate the length of the cell cycle, is going to change if the rate of the cell shape change is different in these particular contexts. So yes, so certainly, I think the cell division cycle is very intimately linked to these morphological changes. And there is one paper out there which definitely looks at lengths uh, of the cell cycle, but it has not been sort of carefully teased apart um, in this system. Well, thanks a lot. Yeah. Micha, can I ask you a question? Yes. Yes, so I'm yeah. wondering, um, in this system, what limits the extent to which the lateral membrane progresses? Yeah. Is it the next cycle of cell cycle that begins? Like how, how does the cell decide when to stop invaginating the lateral membrane in? So because that, would, yeah. that, would, that might play a role in the lateral forces that actually decide the cell shapes. So there are two limits. One is, of course, you know, the new molecules which are going on coming up as the embryo is growing. Yeah. And uh, this is related actually to, uh, to midblastular transition or essentially maternal to zygotic transition, uh, which is also occurring uh, sort of sequentially as these divisions progress with each other. So uh, mm -hmm. there is a change in the concentration of molecules which takes place, for example, in uh, nucleus cycle uh, 12 as compared to 11 or in 13 as compared to 12, there is a greater amount of uh, cadherin which is present in the membranes as compared to the previous cycle, right? So, uh, so right. certainly that greater amount is likely to, for example, stabilize the membrane more and allow for uh, greater extension. And, okay. uh, and then because the cells are becoming smaller and smaller as we uh, proceed with development. The only way they can grow is, uh, you know, into the embryo, vertical, Correct. rather Correct. than horizontal. So that is Correct. another 
just physical constraint. So cells likely grow taller with development. So like the the cells definitely. So yeah, if we could figure out, you know, what these cells are and what are the cell boundaries, then I would say the cells grow taller. So, you know, the limit at which the, the cytoplasmic molecules are accumulating at the cortex also keeps increasing and they are actually becoming taller. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. There was one more person. Okay. I can. Yeah, I think you can continue. I think. Yeah. So uh, I will try to, you know, shorten uh, this particular part and just give you salient uh, sort of analysis of it. Now, as this uh, cellular architecture complexity is increasing in these uh, so-called syncytial cells where the basal membrane is not present, uh, there are uh, a lot of gradients which are operating, which give rise to the anteroposterior and the dorsoventral axis of this particular system. So here are examples of uh, gradients, for example, bicoid, uh, mRNA as also protein is uh, synthesized from the anterior of the embryo and it spreads more towards the posterior. And uh, here is an example of the dorsal gradient, which I was talking to you about. So this, uh, this view is essentially a cross-sectional view of the embryo, where uh, what you see is that dorsal is present to a greater extent on the ventral side, right? So uh, now uh, these are sort of open cells, but you can appreciate that uh, the localization of the mRNA as also the activation of the protein and entry into the nucleus is uh, happening in a very precise uh, location. There is a spread of uh, molecules, but it's certainly slow enough that it is present in a particular region of the embryo, either just the ventral side or just the anterior uh, side of the embryo. And uh, typically, there are uh, typically, I mean, gradient spread is understood by a very commonly uh, known model, which is that of the synthesis diffusion degradation model, where uh, degradation is considered to be uniform throughout the embryo. Synthesis occurs in a particular precise location of the embryo and uh, diffusion occurs based on the properties of that particular uh, protein. So diffusion itself, I think it's intuitive that diffusion itself would depend upon the architecture of that particular embryo. And it's interesting to find out whether diffusion of uh, just gradients or even molecules, any kind of molecules, depends upon the organization of the architecture in this particular embryo, right? So how can we even begin to look at something like this? So first of all, uh, we can look at gradients. Um, there is, this is the bicoid gradient, which is looked with a fluorescently tagged molecule, and this is the dorsal gradient. So again, dorsal, because we want to look at the dorso ventral axis is looking at the cross section of the embryo. So I'll just play these and hopefully you can see that there's, you know, little dots coming up in the anterior here where uh, bicoid is accumulating in the nuclei and the anterior, and you do not see this kind of accumulation at the posterior, right? So the mRNA is hopefully synthesized. It gives rise to proteins. And uh, the, uh, the concentration of the molecules is essentially more towards the anterior. And uh, similarly, for the case of dorsal, there is a concentration of uh, dorsal in the nuclei on the ventral side. And uh, what you're seeing here is basically accumulation of both uh, bicoid and uh, dorsal in a particular region of the embryo as the nuclear division cycles proceed. So, you know, you start seeing more and more uh, circular dots, and these are essentially nuclei where this accumulation is taking place. And uh, the question is whether this kind of spread or even the spread of other architectural molecules actually depends upon the organization of the uh, of the cells or the protocells at this particular time. So I'm just summarizing a lot of uh, work done where what we know is, uh, for example, each nucleus in this particular syncytial embryo has its endoplasmic reticulum, it has a Golgi complex, it has mitochondria, and uh, it has yolk at the bottom. It has uh, the only continuous entity actually it has is the plasma membrane. And uh, the plasma membrane then actually uh, is... Uh, is showing the specific distribution of molecules like I showed in the previous uh, uh, story uh, across the entire embryo, right? So 
uh, there is uh, some sort of organization which is present around each nucleus uh, forming a nucleocytoplasmic domain. And uh, the cytoplasmic molecules itself are present uh, everywhere, right? So uh, there is somewhat a change in the way the cytoplasmic molecules exchange with each other, depending upon the location in which they are present. Um, now the plasma membrane is the only continuous uh, structure. And uh, if you, for example, look at uh, the plasma membrane diffusion by doing this kind of photoactivation experiment, what one sees is that, so I'll just activate molecules in a certain region of the embryo. And what you see here is that there is, you know, the molecules get activated, the cells get divided, but pretty much there is the distribution of these plasma membrane molecules in this location itself, all right? It's not as if it's spreading in a larger region of the embryo. So really this is a sort of a pseudo cell where, uh, where whatever is present in this membrane remains more so in this membrane as compared to this membrane, all right? And, uh, you know, because I'm also running short of time, I'm just going to summarize a set of things which we analyzed through uh, two different modes of uh, generating gradient in the embryo, right? So one of them is that we can use photoactivation as a tool to actually activate a subpopulation of molecules in a particular region of the embryo, just like, for example, it would be bicoid or some molecule in the anterior of the embryo. And the other way is that we can localize a protein of our interest in the anterior and then ask about how much it will spread in this embryo, right? So I'm going to cut short what I have here and just show you these uh, gradients. So, uh, so here is one way of uh, forming a gradient, which is in your hand, for example. This is the gradient of photoactivatable GFP. And what we're doing is we are activating uh, PAGFP at the anterior of the embryo, or we are activating PAGFP tubulin, which is a cytoskeletal molecule at the anterior of the embryo. So this sort of should remind you very much of for how uh, bicoid is present at the anterior of the embryo, right? And there is a flow of molecules which is taking place. There are two very interesting and striking things about this flow. One is that the flow actually takes place more in the cortex and not in this bulk region of the embryo. And the other is that we can compare the flow in between two kinds of molecules. One, which is tubulin, which engages with the cytoskeleton. The other, which is a cytoplasmic molecule, really doesn't engage with anything and ask about their relative spread in the system. All right. So, uh, so just to cut a long uh, you know, analysis short, what we see is that, for example, if we compare the relative spread of PAGFP as compared to PAG, uh, PAGFP tubulin, it's not surprising that GFP spreads more than tubulin does. And when we, for example, use the same kind of mutants, which I showed you in the previous study, where we can break furrows or break the membrane extension inside the embryo, what we find is that this difference between PAGFP and the PAGFP tubulin now is gone, right? So the spread becomes exactly the same. So this, this goes to say that these particular furrows, which are present uh, in between the adjacent uh, nuclei are responsible for restriction of spread of molecules in this particular embryo system, right? So this is one uh, set of gradient data we have. And I will just show you an example of the other, where, uh, for example, we can create uh, another way of creating a gradient, which is that we can, uh, you know, anchor any molecule into the anterior of the embryo by using what we know about bicoid itself, right? So bicoid anchors into the anterior of the embryo because its mRNA actually binds to a certain set of factors which are deposited at the anterior. And uh, then, you know, we can, we can remove bicoid out of it. And here we've put a plasma membrane molecule. This is a PHPLC CFP. And uh, this now we can deposit in the anterior. And now this is a molecule very different from bicoid. Bicoid goes inside the nucleus, whereas 
the uh, PHPLC is going to anchor to the plasma membrane. And so here is a nice comparison between the two. So what you see is that bicoid, as usual, as expected, will go into the nucleus. And whereas uh, something like PHPLC will actually be present at the plasma membrane, and you can see plasma membrane dynamics, which are happening at the anterior, it's more concentrated at the anterior as compared to the posterior. So in this as well, we can ask if, for example, we removed furrows or removed, you know, blocked this architecture. So essentially this shows you that the polygon architecture is present in controls. And in the case of some mutants that we have, we can break this kind of polygon architecture. Some membranes are missing. What we see is that the spread of the gradient is all over the place, right? So if we look at controls, both bicoid as well as the PHPLC form this exponential gradient. Whereas when we remove some of the furrows, now the spread of the molecules is much more, right? So molecules exchange to a greater extent. And this is just one example of a movie which actually shows you the exchange of molecules when this kind of architecture is disrupted, all right? And I'm, I'm going to skip that, but we can discuss that if there are questions. So I'll just summarize here where uh, what I'm trying to say is that this particular lateral membrane is somewhat responsible for restricting the spread of cytoplasmic molecules in this uh, system. And when the lateral membrane is lost, the spread increases. What this little model that we made found very nicely actually was that this spread in between adjacent uh, you know, pseudo cells or proto cells uh, increases only when, for example, the cytoplasmic diffusion of these molecules also increases to a great extent. All right, so, so the, these little membranes are not only blocking or not only attracting molecules into the plasma membrane, but they are also responsible for restricting the cytoplasmic component of uh, molecules which are present in this particular system. Yeah, and that essentially brings me to the summary of my talk where I've shown you that uh, epithelial-like cells uh, form in this particular system where we have a change in plasma membrane lengths into the embryo from circular to polygonal. And uh, this particular change in shape is likely to be important, not only for, for example, keeping spindles apart, like I said earlier, but also for restricting the spread of cytoplasmic and plasma membrane molecules in this particular system. Yeah, thanks. So again, acknowledgements, this wouldn't, this wouldn't have been possible without Bipasha Samir and a whole host of other students. And the you know, analysis of the cytoplasm would not have been possible without our collaboration with Amitabh Mithun, Bipasha and Pompa. Thanks a lot, Richa. Uh, it was an excellent talk. Uh, I think we have uh, a little time for some more questions. Uh, if... Richa, I sort of have a question, which is, um, I mean, I'm still thinking how to frame it correctly. But the 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 spread of the morphogen that is um, that has been known in the field for a while and the fish embryo and all model organisms go through this spreading of morphogen phases. How much of that um, depends upon, let's say, the, the molecule itself, like well, how bicoid is as a molecule versus the, um, something else? And how much of it depends upon, let's say, cytoplasmic crowding that is occurring in the anterior yeah. part of the embryo versus the posterior part of the embryo. So most of these studies have been done focusing on the molecule itself, not as much as its environment. But when we're talking about a spread, the environment would clearly exert. Yeah, so, so this was actually the reason to test this. And, uh, you know, in these studies, we have also done that, where, for example, in the previous analysis, we have actually activated the uh, 
you know, just activated or uh, photoactivated molecules either in the anterior or in the posterior yeah. or in the middle. Okay. Yeah. And what we see uh, very interestingly is actually the anterior and the posterior look quite similar to each other. But okay. when we activate molecules in the middle, it is uh, significantly slower spread as compared to the anterior and the posterior. You know, it's the same molecule being activated and it's diffusing out. And uh, so certainly the uh, so that uh, predicts that uh, if bicoid was activated in, uh, let's say, the middle as compared to the anterior, then it's likely to have different uh, kinetics of spread. And uh, also depending upon the cell type, right? So these are, of course, incomplete cells. Uh, right. but it doesn't have a basal membrane. So they are uh, sort of tuned to allowing exchange of these particular uh, molecules to take place. But uh, even complete cells, I would imagine, uh, will have uh, this characteristic that depending upon the architecture of the cell, the diffusion will change. So not only is the properties of the molecule, but also the properties of the architecture supposed to could basically collaborate together to yeah. uh, give rise to uh, the rate of its spread across a particular region. And uh, there are studies, there are studies, uh, for example, in the DBP gradient, which do look at uh, different molecules, uh, create gradients of now different molecules and look at their spread. And uh, mm. kinetics of those are uh, sort of available in, okay. in, in the wing system for Drosophila. Okay. I had one question, Isha. Yes. Isha? Yes, I can Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. So uh, and the, the outer shell that you are drawing in all these pictures, uh, at which stage does that go away? This outer shell? Are you talking about this outer yeah, shell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this outer shell essentially uh, the, uh, you know, when the, uh, when the embryo has become almost uh, the larva, it just hatches out and uh, it, that goes away. So it's okay, there okay. throughout this early stages uh, okay. till a lot of very complex uh, tissue architecture is formed. Um, almost all the tissues uh, form and uh, it becomes an almost fully formed larva and then breaks okay. away. From okay. The reason I'm asking is that when the, uh, I mean, when this um, uh, cells actually closes the first layer, I mean, after a couple of oscillations of these lateral walls, at some point the cells close, right? Yes, absolutely. So yeah, right. the cells so close that, in that cycle 14 when I was showing you this movie where the, the lateral the membrane extends downwards. After that, right? Here, when I was showing you this movie. Yeah. So this one essentially shows that the plasma membrane extends downward and it forms these really tall, which are 35 micron tall uh, cells. And it closes at the bottom, yes. Okay, and the folding of the of this unicellular structure, sort of, which is stuck to the wall initially, then it starts to fold inward, right? To, yes. Okay. So, 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 in some sense, I mean, the thicker, I mean, the taller these cells, it is more difficult to fold at a later stage. Yeah. So, right? I mean, there are very interesting forces which are needed for extension of this membrane inwards. So, you know, I mean, it's like the entire network is extending inwards into the embryo and all together. So it's not just happening at a single cell level, but hopefully this entire network is actually extending inwards. Right. Okay. And the and existence of the shell basically prevents it to fold outward, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, all the molecular components are present inside the uh, cell and uh, the assembly of the uh, contractile machinery occurs uh, inside the embryo and uh, that already gives it a polarity of uh, movement. And um, so it's occurring on that side. It is not an imagination. It's an imagination. Yeah. Okay. Any further questions? Uh...
Um, if not, let's thank Richa for uh, thank you, Richa, for this excellent talk. It was uh, really so uh, nice to listen to the, in such detail. Um, so we'll close this meeting. Uh, so the next uh, installment of this colloquium will be on next month on the 12th of October. And Andrea Cavania from Rome will be speaking in the next colloquium. Uh, so thanks, everybody, and hope to see you again next month. Thank you. I really want to thank you to give me this opportunity. And it was really nice for me to especially get, you know, address the questions of the first part. But yeah, hopefully next time I can just talk about the gradient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.